This is the screencast tutorial for how to use the program GPower to determine two things. First of all is a priori power, that is computing the required sample size that you need to achieve a desired level of power for a study, given levels of alpha and effect size. And the other thing is to compute post hoc power, that is exactly what is the obtained level of power you have in a study given your sample statistics to estimate things like effect size, as well as the alpha level that you used in your study. Now the nice thing about GPower is, as you can see here, there are a variety of statistical tests that you can select from. So we're not going to cover all of these this semester or last semester or even over the course of this curriculum, okay? but there really is a lot of flexibility in the program GPower for any design that you might come up with. There's different test families as well. Right now we're going to stick with just the t-tests, but as you can see, f-tests, which are, may be required for your upcoming project, are available in here as well in addition to things like chi-square and z-tests that we've done in the past. Again, what we're going to do is stick with t-tests for now. And let's look at the first example. Say that what we want to do is to determine what sample size would be required to achieve a desired level of power for a paired samples t-test. So we know we're in the t-test family. And then we go over to statistical tests and find the test in which we're interested. In this case, a paired samples, or what they're calling a matched pairs t-test, is indeed what we're looking at, the difference between two dependent means. So we select that test. Now as I mentioned, in GPower, all you have to do is to fill in the different values that you know and it will calculate the unknown value for you. So in this case, the first thing we want to do is to tell it what type of test that we're looking at. A priori or post hoc. Now you can see there are a lot of other options in here as well, but these are going to be the only two in which we're interested. For now, let's do the a priori test, which is going to tell us what is our required sample size to achieve a desired level of power. Then what we need to do is to let it know whether it's a directional or a non-directional hypothesis by telling it the number of tails. We know that a non-directional test is a two-tailed test. A directional test is a one-tailed test. Let's assume for now that we're going to be going with the two-tailed test. Now as mentioned in lecture, all we then need to know are what are our effect size, our alpha level, and our desired power, and then what we can do is to then compute the sample size that would be necessary in order to achieve that level of power. So the effect size here at 0.5 is a moderate effect size. We can simply change that value to anything we want. If we think it'll be a little bit larger, 0.6. If we think it would be a small effect size, 0.2. 0.8 for a large effect size. Those are conventional levels. So let's just stick with a moderate effect size of 0.5. Our alpha level is indeed going to be a value of 0.05, as it is always going to be in this course and in behavioral science in general. And then what we can do is to say, what is the level of power that we would desire? Now 0.95 is a great level of power. Recall what this means is that if there really is an effect, we want there to be a 95% chance of detecting this effect in our study. Now we might not want such a stringent requirement. Let's lower this down to something like 90%. And that's all it takes is inputting your effect size estimate D, your alpha level, and your desired power, and then clicking on calculate. Now what it's going to produce is a graph similar to the one that we saw in lecture as well, okay, where it's showing you the red distribution represents the null distribution. The dashed blue distribution represents the potential alternative or research hypothesis. And you can see the shaded areas for alpha and beta, similar to the way they were discussed in lecture. Now what's going to be important for us then is looking at what is going to be the sample size that's required to achieve this level of power. The place you can find that is right here under total sample size. And we can see that we need a total of 44 participants in this study. That is, in a within subject situation where we're comparing two dependent means, we would need 44 people. And then of course we know this would be a within subject study where these 44 people are participating in both conditions. Now there's a couple other things we want to look at here. In particular one thing we can do is to look at the XY plot for a range of possible values. If we want to do that, then all you need to do is to click on the button at the bottom that brings up this plotting window. And you can change everything you want in here as well. You can change the effect size. You can change your alpha level. And you can set some other uh, specific details as well. For example, say that what you want to see is the sample size required to achieve different levels of power ranging from 0.5 all the way up to 
0.95. Once you set the details and the values how you like them, then all you have to do is click Draw Plot, and then it will show you the values. Specifically, to achieve a, a certain level of power, which is shown on the x-axis. Say that we want to achieve power of 0.8. We can use this plot then to see how many participants are going to be required. If we read over on the y-axis, it's going to show us about 33 participants are required, total sample size, given our effect size and alpha level, in order to achieve that power of 0.8. And it's really that simple. There's a second example we can look at as well. So say that you don't have your effect size in particular. For example, what you may be doing is basing your effect size off of previous research. Say you run one study, things didn't go so well, yet you have the data, the sample data from that previous study that you can use to estimate effect size for an upcoming study, for example. Any situation like this where you want to use the sample statistics to determine your effect size can be done by clicking on this Determine button here on the left. What that's going to do is to open up this little side window or drawer. And in here what you can do is to calculate the sample statistics, enter them in directly, and then it will determine the effect size for you. Okay. So for example, we know that when we're calculating a paired samples t-test, we end up calculating a mean difference score and a standard deviation of that difference score. So if you come and select this radio button for from differences, and say that we've done a study where we find a mean difference of say 2, and a standard deviation among the different scores of, say, 5.5. Then we can click this Calculate button here at the bottom, and it will do the effect size calculation for us. Now, this is a pretty simple calculation, which I'm sure you could verify using a calculator as well. But if you have these sample statistics handy, this is a convenient way for it to calculate the effect size. And then by clicking the other button, Transfer to Main Window, then you can see what it does is it copies the effect size into the main window of G-Power directly for you. From there, everything else proceeds as normal. You can simply click Calculate to determine your total sample size necessary. In this case, it would be 82. You can see as the effect size went down from 0.5 to 0.36, the sample size required went up to maintain the same level of power. And once again, you can click for the XY plot to show an entire range of values. So, let's look at one other type of test, the independent samples t-test. Because although the logic is the same, and I'm sure you could figure it out for yourself, but it is handled a little bit differently. So let's take a look at that one now as well. Again, this is still going to be a t-test. But specifically, this is going to be differences between means of two independent groups. This, then, is the independent samples t-test in G-Power. So clicking on here. Again, what we may still want to know is what is the sample size that's going to be required to achieve a specific desired level of power. So again, everything is the same. So let's look at the same effect size of 0.5, alpha of 0.05, power again of, let's say, 0.90, just changing the values in the boxes here. Okay? The only other box that's on here is the allocation ratio, N2 to N1. Now specifically, what we're going to strive for in an independent samples test is to have equal sample sizes in the two groups. Well, if that's the case, then the ratio of sample size between the groups is going to be equal to 1. But it may not always be the case. For now, let's assume it is. And if it is, you can simply click Calculate. And then it's going to show you the sample size in each group, 70 and 70, for a total sample size of 140. Now, if you have a different allocation ratio, let's say that you have different numbers of people within the two different groups. Say that it's an allocation ratio of 0.75. Okay? This would be an example if you have, say, 30 people in one group and 40 people in the other group. Well, then, the number of people in one group, 30, over the number of people in the other group, 40, would equal 3 fourths, or 0.75. In this case, you still just click Calculate. And again, it's going to show you the sample size that you need, which you can see is 142 here, and then how they're going to be allocated across the two different groups. Now you may notice that the total sample size necessary in this case has gone up a little bit. Okay, and This is an important point in an independent samples t-test, that you actually achieve the highest level of power if your sample, your total sample, is allocated evenly across the two groups. Now another thing that we can do here is to think about 
using the determine window in order to enter the sample statistics just like we did for the paired samples test. Okay. Now in this case, again, what we may want to do is just enter in the sample data. Say we've collected some data. We find the mean of the first group is 55, mean of the second group is 45, standard deviation, one group is 6, say the other group is 7. We can use this to calculate our effect size here as well. Transfer it to the main window, which it's done, and then complete the calculation for us. Okay. In this case, of course, with such a large effect size, we see that we need relatively fewer people in the two groups. Now, if we don't have equal effect sizes, which is the top radial button here in this calculation or determine drawer, then what we may do is to enter in the mean of the two groups. Again, let's say it's 55 and 45. Then what it asks for here is the standard deviation within each group. Now it's important to note what this is going to be is essentially the pooled standard deviation. That is the square root of the pooled variance estimate that we know how to calculate. Let's say that's something like 6.2, just to select a number. Again, we can calculate the effect size, transfer it to the main window, and then calculate the sample size necessary to produce the desired level of power. Once again, with such a large effect size, the sample size that we need in each group is relatively pretty small. So finally, let's look at an example of how we can then calculate post hoc power. Now remember, this is going to change a little bit because what we're looking at finding now is not for a given level of power, what is our sample size, but given our sample size, what is our achieved level of power? Now for this, we're just going to stick with the independent samples t-test and doing it for the dependent test is very similar, so I'm not going to go back through the motions there. But again, what you can see, it has happened to retain the values that we calculated in our last analysis. This may or may not be the case. Okay? But what you can do, in this case especially, is because you're doing this post hoc, you're typically going to have exactly the values that would go in these boxes over here. Okay? So just to change the numbers to produce a different example, say we have uh, one class that gets a 75 average on an exam, another class gets a 72 average, we have the standard deviation for the exam scores in each group. And if that's the case, again, we can just calculate the effect size. So these are going to be values that are going to come directly out of your analysis, either through SPSS or Excel or wherever you're going to calculate them. Once again, all we have to do is transfer to the main window. Okay. And now then, we're also going to know the sample we had in each group. Let's say that we had 18 people in the first group. And... 20 people in the second group. Now in this case when we calculate, it's going to show us is the calculated, the achieved level of power. In this case rather low, it's 0.27. And you can see that in terms of how we talked about it in lecture, especially with the overlap here of the alternative distribution, and specifically how much of it is to the left of our critical value, which is shown in green. Well, that's the last example that I wanted to go through. What we've seen now is how to do two things, how to calculate a priori power. That is, for a given desired level of power, what is the sample size necessary to achieve it? And post hoc power, given all of our sample statistics, that is, the values that are associated with our exact experimental design, or our study, that is, our sample means and standard deviations, as well as sample size, what is the obtained level of power that we've achieved within our study? This should be enough to prepare you to not only complete the homework given the effect sizes and other calculations as well as the values that are provided in the homework problems themselves, but it's also going to start to familiarize you with G-Power so that you can do a power analysis for your own upcoming project. Now, the, again, the basic logic is the same even though exactly the boxes you click on are going to be slightly different for your study depending on the exact nature of the design. But that's something that your lab instructors can walk you through as well, depending on whether or not, for example, you have a factorial design or a situation where you have a single independent variable with multiple levels, so forth and so on. So thanks for tuning in today, and good luck with the homework.